So you had the spirochete in your body. Mm -hmm. They took your blood. Yes. Did they not find the spirochete? Uh, several times they took my blood and they did not find the spirochete. Sometimes that can happen, they say, uh, with advanced case, cases of Lyme. You know, it's it's just not really being detected by your body, but your body is deteriorating at the same time. So you, you say advanced cases. Mm -hmm. you, you you have an initial reaction and then there's a kind of a remission and then it comes back? For me, that's how it worked. And, you know, a lot of times it can go undiagnosed and and really you're just making compensations as you're progressing with the disease until eventually it becomes an issue where you must do something yeah and and generally it's not detected uh, early on after after infection it usually takes um, um, several weeks for antibodies to be formed um, and then in later infection sometimes it's uh, it's it's difficult to to detect or the body the body doesn't create antibodies anymore um, for various reasons. Um, so I, I think the point that needs to be made is we need to have more good research on um, how to detect the, um, the bug. Um, why is it, why is it uh, evading the, um, the immune system and why is it resistant to antibiotics? And how to remove. <laughs> how many reported new cases are there each year? Um, well, that's also a good question. The the uh, the, um, the official estimate based um, from the CDC is this year, last year, 2007, is 27,444 cases. Now, that in itself is a 37 percent increase from the previous year, but they also say that that number is um, from six to 12 times. Um, uh, smaller than what what the, the the real cases may be, which make it, and this is really important to say, possibly over 300,000 cases a year, which is 10 times the number of HIV infections, and throw into that, add to it, um, uh, avian flu, West Nile virus, and swine flu combined, and not, and we don't know the real numbers because it's so often misdiagnosed. Because it's misdiagnosed, and because it's underreported. And think about it, if there's a 50% chance that if you were to go to the doctor, it's a 50-50 shot. Are you going to have Lyme or are you not going to have Lyme? And a lot of times, you'll only be able to tell later once, you know, you've had to suffer through some disabilities. And a lot of phys physicians don't want to report. They don't, they don't want to, to get involved in the Lyme disease issue. So if they even have a Lyme disease patient, they won't report it. And we'll take a little break. We'll come back and find out why they don't <laughs> want to report it. My guests are Andy Abrahams Wilson, whose film Under Our Skin opens uh, this weekend. Right? Is it opening today? Yeah, tonight at the IFC Center on Sixth Avenue in the Village. Also, Mandy Hughes, uh, who is one of the people featured in the film, and they will both be in attendance during this weekend's screenings to answer questions. For the questions, we will continue our conversation after this. <laughs> I'm back with Andy Abrahams Wilson. His latest film is called Under Our Skin, and it opens today at the IFC Center on 6th Avenue in Greenwich Village. One of the people in the film is Mandy Hughes. She's also here. And we're talking about Lyme disease and why it is so hard to diagnose and also why it's become such a controversial medical issue, uh, which is pretty much uh, a major portion of what the film is about uh, because we have these people who come down with this mysterious illness and uh, doctors tell them they don't have it. Uh, and, and that's what happened with you. you um, yes. So what happens when a doctor tells you it's all in your head? Shock. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a, a bit of, you know, anger and frustration. Um, just because if you've gotten to a point where <laughs> you've heard a lot of different you know, symptoms and issues attached to, you know, what's going on with you, and no one seems to be able to resolve that and or come close, then, you know, the frustration builds, and every time you encounter an, a new physician that has something else to add to it, it just, you know, it, it ends up being a big mess. And and, and I'm going to jump in here. Um, what Mandy's talking about, these sort of this, this um, maze of multiple doctors and multiple diagnoses and um, and they all seem to disagree. 
Yeah, but it's not. It's not. Um, it, this is not just an isolated instance. It's not just Mandy. It's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it's it's just un, unbelievable the the untold numbers of people who have the who have the same story. So let's talk about some of the doctors. You mentioned Dr. Willie Bergdorfer, who discovered the uh, the spiral heat that causes uh, Lyme disease and has uh, the has it named after him Borrelia burgdorferi. Berger, when did he do that? Uh, this was um, about 30 years ago. So th- this is a long time now. This is a long time. And what about Dr. Alan McDonald? Why is he significant to the story? Well, he's significant because he's doing frontline research and um, he's done research connecting Lyme disease to, as as I s- spoke about before, it's its cousin syphilis, and he's basically saying that there's a lot of similarities between syphilis and Lyme disease. But syphilis does respond immediately to antibiotics. Correct. And so the question is, why is this why is this other bacteria, why is this other spirochete, Lyme disease, so difficult to to detect and treat? And it's it's um it's a it's a more virulent bug. And he also wants to know why roughly 50% of patients with Lyme disease turn up negative for the disease when they're initially tested. Right. Does anybody have any theory? Oh, yes. There's a lot of theories that the, that the bug changes its antigenic structure, um, which makes it more difficult for the um, antibodies to, to detect. Um, it morphs into other, other forms. Um, and then he had another uh, more recent um, hypothesis or discovery, which is that, that the, the bacteria that cause Lyme actually sort of live um, in a biofilm, which is sort of like a gel-like structure, which makes it both difficult to, to detect the, the bacteria, but also difficult to treat. Why have doctors lost their licenses or closed their practices because of the way they were treating patients? Um, well, you know, it's curious, and that's, this, this is a, a question that, that goes to the heart of our recent um, health care or our current health care debate. Because one doctor even says that it's, kinda, it's a political issue as well. Absolutely. And why is it that, that um, um, patients in conversation with their physicians can't be treated? Um, and why is it that, that physicians who are doing their best to help their patients um, uh, risk losing their medical uh, licenses. Who takes the licenses away? Well, they're the state medical boards. I mean, there are people who really, who have botched up operations continually, who continue to have their retain their licenses. Absolutely, absolutely, and and that's what's so puzzling about this. Now, you know, if if I hadn't spent so long working on this project and delving into the issue, I would believe some of what's said, which are these doctors are charlatans and they're just out to make money, to t- take advantage of, of sick, vulnerable patients. That's what's being said. And that's, that's the, the sort of the assumption that's being made about these doctors. Well, there are people who are suspicious of everything. Michael Savage, that brilliant talk show host, claimed that I think it was 96% of all autism cases are fake. They're just people who are trying to Get, scam the system. Right, right. I and, guess and he's cur- never seen an autistic right. kid. Right, and curiously, you know, a lot of kids who are diagnosed with autism um, end up having Lyme disease. They, they get why treated. Why is that? Well, um, uh, Again. why is that? It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> neurological condition. Nobody knows what causes autism. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, um, uh, Lyme disease is, is, it may be the culprit. It's it's causing you know, it's Lyme disease is ca- it does cause the, uh, cognitive and neurological issues and in children often it's diagnosed as autism. Some doctors don't believe in using antibiotics in treating this. Why? Well, because most they don't believe in late stage or chronic Lyme. So th- there's another problem here. There's, there's some doctors believe you can have Lyme disease, but it's just something Easy that hits you treat, right away. And hard then to get. we we got a. A call from a listener, George, in Astoria. He said, I was diagnosed last summer. I caught it quick because of multiple bullseye marks on my body. I went through a four-week antibiotic regimen. What are the chances it will recur? My doctor says I'm fine. Is she right? Well, for sure, I'm not 100% that it, you know, will come back. But I know that it, it did with me. And by the time that, you know, she stated that she had multiple bullseye rashes. I did as well. And that is, that was called disseminated Lyme. And that came a little later, and it had already become chronic for me. But had you been treated like this person was? I had been treated with two weeks of antibiotics, 
I think it was tetracycline. And um, that's pretty strong stuff. Yeah. And that is the current standard of care for Lyme disease. And then the problem was is that the what was not factored in were co-infections. And co-infections can make the Lyme stick around. And then... Is this an opportunistic disease yes, as well? Yes. And so then um, it was tw I was 21, 22. And, you know, just like any chronic illness... You can have a major life event, a stressor, or something happen, and it can trigger it again, and that it did. 